she's a nurse. <laughs> so we were asked to do a first aid class. Um, and I forgot my Bible, just a minute. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not going to give you a Bible lesson. Okay, right here. Okay, cool. Anyways, we were asked to do a first a home first aid class. Prepper. Prepper class. <laughs> so we're not going to get into anything real deep. I actually was going to call Bill because Bill could probably teach the class better than I. <laughs> but um, since we're the nurses and we have the licenses, we're doing it. Um, anyways, but I was laying in bed this morning and thinking first aid. And like first aid class or home first aid. And all of a sudden, for some reason, it came to my mind. I thought the very first thing that happens, who, if you've got an emergency, what do you want to do first, or who would you like to be there first? And I thought to myself, I would like Jesus to be there, but obviously he's not going to come down from the sky and show up at my emergency at my house, but we can pray. So it just, um, just kind of popped into my mind that we need to pray about everything, but obviously all of us know when anyone gets sick or anything happens, we do pray. It may not be our first thing that we do, but rather than reading all of the scripture verses, I've got three that I wanted to talk about. In um, Exodus 15, it talks, I remember how Moses um, was taking the Israelites and they hadn't obeyed. And God says that if you don't want to get all these diseases that I put on the Egyptian people, if you obey me, he says, I'll keep those diseases from you. So he says in Exodus 15, 26, he says, for I, the Lord, am your healer. And I think so often when I call people and we're talking about COVID or we're talking about some kind of stressor disease, I always remind myself and who I'm talking to on the phone that we, God's name is Jehovah um, Rapha, which means the Lord who heals. It also talks about in Psalms 103, and I like to open my Bible rather than just reading, saying it. So Psalms 103 says, um, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. And I know for a lot of people who have friends that are sick and all, the Lord doesn't heal all of our diseases here on earth, but once we get to heaven, we'll be healed. Mm -hmm. And the last verse I wanted to share with you, kind of is a little repetitive, but it's in Psalms 147, 3, and it says here, he heals the brokenhearted, he binds up their wounds. And I think there's a lot of things that go along with medical disease that also have emotional disease. So I think mm -hmm. the Lord, I don't think, I know that he wants to heal us emotionally and he wants to heal us physically. So before we begin our little in service, I call it, <laughs> um, let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we just thank you that you're here. We just invite you to come in and help us maybe to learn some things that we don't know already and that we would just be able to bless one another with our fellowship time together. We love you and we thank you that you love us and that you will heal all of us one of these days when we see you face to face. So in Jesus' name, amen. So Mary is going to, we've got a couple of parts that we're going to, so Mary's going to talk about a few things and then I'll talk about a few things. <laughs> okay, one of the first things we were going to talk about is CPR certific certification. Is that, okay. <laughs> and um, uh, if you if you work someplace that has the ability to give the classes, that is great. Please take advantage of it, and um, just basic is fine. What we nurses have to take, you know, adult and pediatrics and all that stuff, it, you know. Um, because the hospital will, they offer it pretty regularly. It'll cost if you don't work for the hospital, it'll cost you some money, but not a lot. You get. So I know you can. There used to be the fire station offered it. I We're not know. sure about that, yeah. So, <laughs> But anyway, so if you have the opportunity at all, it is so important. Um, it's, you know, um, some of the basic um, uh, cardiopulmonary respiratory, <laughs> respiratory problems, um, some are way too difficult to handle in the field. And, um, but we got to try. We have to, you know, give it a, a go and hope that maybe... EMS will be there really fast. If this is if we're outside of the hospital and stuff. So anyway, if you have your certification and just as if you can help, I mean, I know I was on a cruise one time, and some lady behind me was choking, and I was able to do the Heimlich and and um, and saved her. <laughs> it was really great, you know. So it's just, and it was a very simple thing. So, but it was just that she definitely had an occlusion in her throat, and she um, could cough it out, and 
we went on. <laughs> so anyway, um, <clears throat> then we just kind of wanted to go over a little bit of general safety. And that's uh, kind of what do you have at home? What do you need to know for just basic um, first aid and basic um, safety and everything. And one of the main things is if you are on a lot of medications or even a few, um, we've handed out these little cards. They're great to have when you go to the hospital because they always ask you what medications you're on. And um, yeah, you can hold up yeah. a pretty little stick it in your wallet or stick it in your purse. And like, um, like Nancy was saying, a lot of people put their medications in their phone, but if for some reason you were unconscious and you didn't, and whoever was with you didn't have your phone code, you know, that won't help. But if you had this, and it's so easy just to hand it to the nurse or whatever, and just, you, you don't have to worry about going over everything. Your dosages like are you on here. Immediately in the ER. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so anyway, so on your medications, you should have about a month's supply. Uh, with things looking the way they are right now, everything's going to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> but it's a good idea to have a good month's supply of your medications. For any number of reasons, you might not be able to get to the pharmacy. The pharmacy may be out, one thing and another. So, so try to have um, put away or, you know, in some safe place out of reach of children, um, of course, about a month's supply of your medications. And, um, and then some other things we talked about were um, safety things around the house, like especially if, if you've had recent surgery and you're using a walker or crutches, please be careful of throw rugs because they slip and slide and they <laughs> everything and you can just be down on your bottom immediately and another thing is ladders don't climb ladders if you're older <laughs> somebody else can do it <laughs> so and of course um, be sure your stoves are not on and that all the little handles are too off you should always have fire and carbon monoxide detectors in your house and um, a fire extinguisher and kind of keep it up to date if possible. And, uh, and Nancy put down here chimney cleaning, which is a good thing so you don't have a fire in your, um, when you start using your, your chimney or your fireplace at the first part of the year. So You're the chimney sweeper that my husband used to be. And <laughs> took ladders from one level to another roof and another ladder <laughs> to another roof. That is not wise. I don't care if you were 32 or 62. It's just not smart. But, I mean, and ladders are so dangerous. Make sure that if you are on a ladder, whoever you are, that you've got a spotter. I think that's yeah. really important. And men don't like spotters because they can do it all themselves. <laughs> but I really think that's important. It is, so. And then um, there's, a, you know, there's just a multitude of things, but we're just kind of covering a little um, segment. segment, yeah. So the next thing that we were going to talk about a little bit is a, a general stock of what you should have, and that would include things like flashlights and then batteries for your flashlight. Be sure you have um, uh, your radio that has a battery operator up a battery operated radio so if you lose um, electricity you've got that phone chargers of course that won't help if there's no electricity but <laughs> otherwise and uh, lamps candles things like that for when the lights go out which they do frequently here I mean, we have a number of oil lanterns at our house but one time when the power went out for a few days I didn't have enough oil so remember it oils cheap for those and they stock and it's sick and it could set in a cupboard very easily. So make sure you have enough oil because those oil lanterns take up, yeah, they use fuel too. Yeah. Was I going to yeah. do this uh -huh. or are you going to do that? You go ahead. Oh, okay. And then um, different injuries, just ways to kind of uh, keep them. Um, if you fall, of course, the main thing you want you to do is ice and elevate. Ice for the first 48 hours. And um, after that, you can use heat. To something if it makes it feel better but the ice helps hold down the swelling and if the swelling is down 
it's not going to lean on all those nerves, so the pain is going to be down. So that's one of the things when we have patients in the emergency room and they are, um, we send them out in a sling if they've broken their arm, but that's really not elevated. What we tr I try to tell the patients is, is think about having a drop of, of water on your wrist, and what you want it to do is you want it to flow to down and to the heart, and um, it won't, that's not going to happen if you're like this. So it's okay when you're one, up and around and everything, but when, and this also, of course, for legs, if you injure a leg and stuff. Um, when you're just sitting around, get a bunch of pillows. Put your leg way up, put your arm up in a bunch of pillows. If you're just going to sit around and watch TV anyway, because <laughs> if you're injured really badly like that, you're not going to be doing too much. So if there's a deformity, um, to the bone, and you can see uh, most, of, like Patty has had plenty of, of fractures, and I have. I broke my wrist and everything, and you could tell it was broken. <laughs> There's no question, you really don't even need an x ray. But um, if you do have a deformity, then you do want to be seen but and you have don't it. Wait for a week or two and think, oh, maybe it's just sprained and it's going <laughs> to be okay, because it can do a lot of other damage to the nerves, etc. So if you're in doubt, go to the that's what they're there for. So, anyway, for head injuries, um, a lot of people really get really concerned about head injuries, and um, they're not all that bad. All they're not all bad. They um, you can as long as you have not lost consciousness and you don't have a lot of the side effects like vomiting and dis unequal pupils and that type of thing. Then there's really not a lot to do. You can put ice if you have a hematoma. A lot of times if you fall on either forward or backward, you'll have a hematoma like on your forehead. And um, an ice pack is the best thing you can do. And um, it's, it just, um, it, but now if you have things like vomiting and altered mental situation, it, um, we, we definitely say you need to be seen for those things. Um, and if you do have a little head injury, um, one of the main things people always say, well, don't let them go to sleep. Don't let them sleep. And that's kind of old-fashioned. We say it's okay to sleep. The one thing is if you wake someone up, you just want to make sure that they know who they are and where they are. And if they know those things, it's okay to go back to sleep. If, you get, if they start becoming mo mo mentally altered, then that's when you want to have them seen so, and then there's a lot of nosebleeds up here in Big Bear because of the altitude and the dryness. And um, we get a lot of nosebleeds in the emergency room too, but a lot of them can be handled by direct pressure. And that is just holding right below that bridge of the nose, holding pretty, not tight so you hurt yourself or anything, but, but hold, for, hold at the bridge um, and hold for 15 minutes. A lot of people say they hold it for a second and then they take out their, their hand, and that's you're not letting giving the blood vessels time to clot up a little bit, and that's what you want it to do. So, if um, if you you can just hold pressure for like 15 minutes. Now, if you have heavy bleeding, and if after 15 minutes you're still bleeding quite a bit, then then again you probably want to be seen. But um, a lot of nosebleeds can be handled just by holding pressure, kind of sit slightly forward in position, and, um, and like I say, you can kind of tell. I mean, there, there's some that are just very light, and it's not to, not to worry about it, but if you have one that just keeps bleeding and bleeding and just swallowing blood, you can, um, then, then that's a posterior bleed, so you probably want to be seen then, so. And burns, a lot of burns. Um, if they're minor burns, you just want cold water. No butter, <laughs> no oil, just cold water and um, antibiotic ointment then if you, if you have it. Um, the best thing is a sulfa type um, medication that we have at the emergency room, but I think you need a prescription for it. But it's, if you go to the ER and they put silvadine on, if you could take that container home, yeah, they, they, they give it to you. For it. And yeah. I think it's like $90 minimum for this little container, and it will last for a long time. Yeah, it does. So, so just ask if you can take it home. 
but regular antibiotic ointment on a burn after after you've let it be in cold water for quite a while is is fine so and then if you have an eye problem uh, like you feel like you got a foreign body in your eye or something oh well <laughs> again um, cold water or uh, cold packs on your way to the emergency room so yeah so I uh, you Yeah, yeah. I don't know that answer. Is topical soap, soap okay? Uh, that's you, a good you know, I'm really I've not positive had, yeah, I on know that. that if, you know, with the triple antibiotic, that one, there's one that's got bacitracin that's got um, sulfur. Neosporin. I've never had anybody be allergic to it. But that's a good question. Yeah. Well, Dr. John's not here to ask. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, back to um, eye problems. Just basically flush the eye. You can, if you can get under a, a faucet or whatever, um, if, especially if you get like some kind of a, um, a caustic um, solution in your eye or something, rinse it as much as you can. And um, usually 15 to 20 minutes on something like that too. And then um, it'll probably be sore after that for a while because you know, eye, water running in the eye can kind of make it, you know, <laughs> hurt a little bit. So again, um, if it continues to be painful, then you probably, again, want to be seen because you need to find out if you have, um, if, it, if this um, foreign body or whatever you had caused a um, corneal abrasion or, or, or some kind of thing like that. And those, they're, they're, they heal fast, but they're best treated with an antibiotic eye ointment or eye drops. Not the one that you're putting on your scrape. No. There's a different <laughs> one yeah, for your eyes. So. They're not over the counter. Yeah, prescription. Yeah, so th those are, yeah, most of them. So anyway, um, black eyes, again, put cold pressure on it for a while. And um, what what's I that? Oh, bleeding. bleeding. If it's bleeding, from yeah. A black eye, that injury needs to be seen by your doctor. Like some of these things, y'all don't have to go to the ER. You can make an appointment or go in to see your doctor. But sometimes, just depending, you can err on that. But I think a lot of times we see things in the ER that shouldn't be seen. Yeah. But and that's kind of what we're trying to bring across here: that um, that not everything needs to go to the emergency room. There's so many things that you can do at home that basically sometimes we do the same thing in the ER, you know, and um, could have saved you thousands of dollars. Right. You know, so. I think also sometimes, like I know, Mary, I have people call me all the time and ask me questions about what to do. So lots of times I have the answer, but sometimes I don't. But I think even if it's not calling a nurse, just calling a friend and getting their advice. But if it's something emergent, then call EMS or drive straight to the ER. But I think yeah. sometimes we need to get a little advice from your friend yeah. before you do that. Yeah. I'm going to go over a little bit with wounds. I'm not going to go into when you should get stitches or when you can't. That's kind of a doc call. I mean, and a lot of us, just from experience, know some of these things. But controlling the bleeding, you know, I, I always say God designed our bodies to bleed for a little bit to flush out the bacteria and the dirt and the germs that get in there. Um, so controlled bleeding, um, minimal bleeding for two to five minutes is perfectly fine. Severe bleeding sometimes could be 15 to 20 minutes long, but with pressure, and we'll go over that a little bit when I show you some of these handout things, pressure will help decrease that. So you want to hold pressure for 15 or 20 minutes. You're not going to just hold it for a minute and lift it up and go, oh, it's still bleeding, and think that you need to run off to get it taken care of. Um, but stitches, if you're in, in doubt at all and it keeps bleeding or the gap just seems too big, and most of the time you know it needs stitches, those need to be done in six hours. They don't want to wait till the next day because then all that bacteria has begun to germinate in there and they don't want to seal the bugs in. So and also important. the skin starts to heal really fast. And um, so if you're trying to put together a, a, a laceration that the skin is kind of healed, it's not going to be... It's not going to take. So that's why they like to see lacerations done within six hours. 
and they need to be cleaned. Even with your kids, when they fall down out in the gravelly stuff and they come in, you can't just pat it and think it's clean. You need to take one of those little soft scrub brushes and scrub all the gravel out. We had one of our EMTs that the dogs, anyways, the dogs took care of this big, he had a huge, he'd been out in the forest and had a major accident on his leg. Well, he ended up having problems for, I think it was up to a year, because they thought they had cleaned it out well enough, and the gravel and some of it stayed in, and it became a mobility problem for a young 22-year-old healthy man. So some of those things, if you're in question whether it's clean enough or needs stitches, go to the ER, go to someone who knows. Um, dirty things obviously need a tetanus shot, and a tetanus shot doesn't have to be done that day. It can be done within 48 hours. And we won't go into immunizations and all that because that's too much controversy. Go ahead, Doug. For five years. Yeah. Five, five years for a, 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 big a big wound. If you have just a minor scratch, or something, but you did break the skin, and but it's real light. They say that you can go for ten years. Yeah, so. we, lots of times people come in and it's not a big deal, and they had a tetanus shot six years ago. But the dots tend to be and conservative, where they'll just give you one in case. But five to ten years is good. What's that? Oh, oh did you? <laughs> yeah, do you have an achy arm now? Yeah. <laughs> I always, when I give tetanus shots, I remind the person the pain given it to. I'm not a bad shot giver. <laughs> it hurts when it goes in and it hurts enough for three to five days afterwards. Like you want to take Motrin sometimes. Your arm is so achy. Um, so cleaning wounds. Just the other day we were, had a little boy in Sunday school who fell down, scraped his leg up and one of my helper people took alcohol off and was cleaning it off. Alcohol is no. Hydrogen peroxide is no. <laughs> they decrease healing of tissue. We all did that in the past, or my dad used to pull, I, um, what was it called? Um, iodine. Iodine. Mercurochrome. Mercurochrome. <laughs> the burn like heck. Iodine, burn, yeah. <laughs> all of those are out, soap and water. So let's say you don't have soap, just water, and clean it off. Um, really important. Um, and then antibiotic ointment is great and fine. Also leaving, obviously if something's bleeding or whatever, you cover it for a while, but as soon as it seems like it's not oozing or whatever, even when it's oozing, uncover wounds. The air cleans them, um, dries them up, heals them. Um, sunlight heals them. I mean, not that you want to go out and get them sunburned. But, um, but remember signs of infection no matter what. If you're running a fever, if it starts to get red, the area, and sometimes now that we all, get, all have fancy phones, take a picture of the wound the day it was on your kid, and then three days later, even on yourself, so that you'll be able to say, does it seem worse or not? If it starts to have a drainage, if it starts to smell funny, if you just feel achy like your knee's not bending as well, those are all signs of infection that you may need an antibiotic, I mean, antibiotic orally. Because I was told by a wound care lady one time, antibiotic ointment is only good, the qualities of the ointment itself only last for one hour. So it's, it's making a warm, moist, dark environment if you keep it covered up all the time. We, we use betadine in the emergency room. For, and, uh, for cleaning. For cleaning. Yeah. For soaking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we don't do straight. We, we use... We plus, usually yeah. mix it with some half saline. Half or something, yeah. And ideally, saline is your best thing to clean a wound with. That's what we always use. But it's not worth spending money and buying saline bottles. It, those are hard to find. <laughs> you, you probably could. Yeah. Just put a little salt in it. I guess it's like the, o <laughs> it, it's like the ocean, huh? It kind of helps cleanse things. <laughs> God's made all these natural things. Um, then just going over a little bit with blisters. People like to first pop blisters. Leave the blister, whether it's on your foot or it's on your shoe or your heel, not your shoe, but where the shoe caused the blister. That God designed that little bit of tissue there to uh, once protect it, yeah, to protect you. Once it bursts I mean, on its own, but don't pop it and peel it off. Yeah. <laughs> and then splinters, I'll show you how in our emergency kit, how our first aid kit, that to have um, tweezers and to have a magnifying glass. Splinters are some, uh, I'm a nurse, but I can't get them out at all. Lloyd's great at getting them out. <laughs> but I read just when I was getting ready for this thing, that sometimes if you've got little ones that you can't quite get out, put a piece of tape on it, like masking tape or duct tape, and it will pull it off. I thought that was, I, yeah, so I, 
<laughs> tried that one, but it sounds interesting. Then going on a little bit with kids, children. Um, some of us might be just grandmas here, but there's a, a mom here, <laughs> a couple. So children, if your fever, even for adults, y'all, if your fever is 100.4 and under, docs will tell you, don't treat it. We treat it, and it's not wrong to do it because you feel achy and miserable, and Tylenol or Motrin makes you feel happier. But in reality, your body has a natural defense where that fever is helping to fight the infection. So um, we'll go over in a little bit dosages on things, but um, cooling measures. I know so often we get, and depending on what culture you come from, some cultures are a little worse than other cultures, but we have little children come in, they've got a fever of 102, and their mama has got them in about six layers and wrapped in a heavy blanket, and it's summertime because they feel miserable, you know, whether they're a little kid or a bigger kid. You know, when you get a fever, you get chilly, and you want all these covers on. You need to do cooling measures where I tell them everything needs to be off except maybe a light T-shirt and the diaper or whatever, even for adults, which some of our adult husbands don't listen very well to some of the things we ask them to do. <laughs> and they but have to kick their, keep their diapers on. <laughs> measures are real important and also to observe don't just think your kids got a hundred five temperature you give them the Motrin or Tylenol and then you run off to the emergency room it's going to take an hour for the cooling measures or for the med to work and sometimes give them six eight twelve twenty four hours and this will all go away and they'll be fine but that's another thing that's important to do call, call up an older mom or call up a nurse mom and they'll kind of reassure you that everything's going to be okay um, rashes. That's a big thing that I'm not an expert on, and neither are a lot of emergency room docs. Pediatricians, I think, and obviously dermatologists, all they know better. But so many rush, rashes your kids get or you get, and you have no idea what they came from. But check out, see if you've been using new products, new makeup products, new laundry soaps, new bar soap. Um, many things will cause a rash without you even realizing what it is. Um, but important things to do for rashes, obviously, is Benadryl, um, calamine lotion we'll talk about a little bit, cortisone um, cream that's over the counter that you don't need a prescription for. That does wonders for the itching. A nice little layer of that on a rash would really, it really helps. And once again, I say observe. Don't just run to the doctor because you've got this rash over half your body. Unless, you know, unless the rash or the allergic reaction is affecting your breathing or your tongue is getting thick feeling or you're feeling like your throat's tightening. Those are all different kind of allergic reactions. Yeah. This is just talking about rashes. And one of the other rashes that she didn't mention is new medications. And um, <clears throat> we, like I just the other day at the hospital, I, I had a kid come in and he was just rash covered all over. And I, so I, of course I asked the mother, any new medications or anything? Well, he was in the emergency room three days ago and they started him on an antibiotic. There you go. <laughs> so that's, you know, if you, you, you can just kind of do a little history. And um, a little history is uh, helpful in a lot of things, so. Exactly right. Um, vomiting. Um, kids vomit all the time. Grown-ups, not so much. But um, we all have incidents of, of vomiting. When little kids vomit, we immediately think, because they're so little, that they're going to get dehydrated. But give them, again, time to observe. Find out what's going on. Let them don't, because they vomited a whole bunch, don't then try to get them to drink Pedialyte. Don't, then they can just keep vomiting. Let them have four to eight hours with just nothing in their system. And then slowly add things. And for a lot of health nut moms, the idea of giving them a popsicle or apple juice, it's like that's just like a no-no to them because they don't want that sugar. Well, this is a time where a little bit of sugar and all will be good for them. It'll help them keep things down. So vomiting is important. Make sure that for moms and all, or grandma, if you've got the kids, how many wet diapers do they have? And moms will come in and tell me, they haven't peed all day long. I op rip open the paper diaper. You know, the diapers are so fancy nowadays that it looks like they're dry. But you rip open the diaper, and I tell them, sometimes you have to pee smell it to see if there's pee in that diaper. And so often, these little diapers that mama says they haven't peed all day, the diaper's wet once you really check it. But start noticing, if they start vomiting last night, notice how many times they went in and peed in the potty. And if they're old enough to, go in with them and listen so you know how much is coming out, so you know where the dehydration is or isn't. Um, also notice how much they drank. Don't just give them a bottle. Notice how much is in it or the sippy cup, how much is in it so you know how much they've ingested. We call it I and O's, you know, what they put in and what they took put out is important to know, especially even once you finally get the kid to the doctor so they know a little bit more. And then lastly, just with the little kids,
kids, we talk a lot about um, that to have a poison control number, and I should have written it on your handouts, and I didn't, but the, hand, the number for poison control is 800. It's easy to remember, 800-222-1222. But when you call poison control, remember, make sure you know things. How old the kid is, approximate how much they weigh, what they ingested. And if it was your blood pressure pills, try to do a little math and figure out how many blood pressure pills were in there, how many are now left. Because sometimes it ends up being that, that mama thinks that they swallowed 20 of them and they probably had one. You know, but so it's, it's, and it's important, like you say, when we say keep your medicines out of the reach of kids, kids climb up onto the medicine cabinet, into the medicine cabinet and get stuff out. You really need to have them high enough where they can't get them or some kind of a clip where they can't open open that thing, because that's so common. Um, yeah, and then the, at what time that you caught them to inhale, in yeah, taking time, all this and all these medics. And even that's true with, you know, I'm not going to go into it, suicidal attempts or something, but even with grown-ups where you think somebody has over taken too much of something, to find out how many are there or what it was. What, and with so often, like with alcohol, that's pretty common with little kids. They'll get the alcohol, just rubbing alcohol, and you think they drank half the bottle, but if you see how wet their t-shirt is and their pants are, you know that they didn't ingest most of it. So um, then I just was going to go over most of the stuff you guys all know, just as far as things just to have on hand at your house. And most people probably do this, like an antacid, having Tums. Benadryl's great. You can have adult Benadryl and pop them in half or in quarters, and this can be given to little kids. Um, Pills don't all have to be in liquid form for little kids. You can crush them. My mom used to crush them and put them in jelly or in peanut butter, and kids take stuff, grown up stuff down. Just like with Motrin, Motrin or ibuprofen. These can be crushed too. Um, and I always remind adults, like I've had so many adult girlfriends who are my size who are taking 200 or 400 of Motrin, which if you want to take 400 every four hours, fine. But you can take, any grown up can take, teenagers we give in the ER, 600 Motrin every six hours is perfectly safe. And what, to decide whether you want to take Motrin or Tylenol, Tylenol's fine. For some medications that people are on, they can't take Motrin because it affects, it affects with their bleeding time and stuff. But, so Tylenol is probably your safest. But Tylenol doesn't have the anti-inflammatory qualities that Motrin does. And for little kids, I always say to alternate them for fever. We gave everybody a handout on dosages. The biggest thing we found with kids in the ER that their moms are underdosing them for how much Tylenol or Motrin they're taking of the liquid amount. So it's really important to make sure they're getting the right amount. Their fever is not going to go down. Go ahead. Because if you do have a, if you have a head injury and have a bleed, yeah, right, and and, and that is because of the, uh, you know, if your if your head injury is not a bleed, it's really not too much of a problem. But the problem is you don't know about a bleed yeah, all the time right away. Though. Some of the bleeds can be very slow and show up in a day or two or mm -hmm. more. Yeah, good point to make though. Calamine lotion, you know, is an old-fashioned remedy, but it sure helps with itching and stuff. Also, taking a bath with um, baking soda helps with itching, too, and that's just old-fashioned. And cool water when you have rashes and itching problems, not mm -hmm. warm water. That just brings the blood vessels to the surface and you itch more. Um, a and D, now, I like that I bought a non-brand. If you guys all look at, if you get A and D for kids' bottom rashes and stuff, or diaper rashes, if you buy A and D itself, this, this container, because it's a non-brand, if you look at the active ingredients, the exact same thing. This is $2 cheaper than the, the brand name is. Same thing with Motrin and Tylenol or ibuprofen. It's way economical. Re just do a, two minutes of reading, and you'll find out it's got the same ingredients in it. Yeah, like if you in the gr at the drugstore, you can find different things next to the, the brand name ones, and it'll say CVS brand or something, and, and they are. They're cheaper by far. So. Psychologically. Some people think that Levi jeans are better than Costco jeans. <laughs> they wear the same. But um, I put up aspirin. I want to remind everybody, no one is to take aspirin for pain, period. 
The only reason you have aspirin in your cabinet, 81 milligrams, is if you're a person starting to have a heart attack, you're having a myocardial infarction, you're having symptoms of a heart attack. Take an aspirin, chew it up. It's the first thing we do in the ER when you walk in and when you have symptoms. And you can take four uh, because that just brings you right up to the uh, regular right. adult um, one aspirin. Yeah, and so the chewable ones are best, but I think it's perfectly because fine. Because it to just take. goes to work yeah. a lot faster. Yeah, so it goes to work. So having the ones you can chew is, but if the only ones you have are 325s of regular um, aspirin, that's fine to take. Yeah, you could chew up the other ones, yeah. They taste, they <laughs> Doesn't taste, taste very good. They don't taste as peachy and cherry-ish like as the other ones do. Um, another thing is, um, again, hydrocortisone for itching things is a great idea um, to help. Um, having cough drops in the house. I mean, to me, cough drops and cough medicine, unless you get a prescription cough medicine, kind of like Kool-Aid in my view. <laughs> I don't think it really does a lot of good. I think old-fashioned remedies of hot tea with a little lemon and honey may do a lot better for your cough than spending the money on the cough yeah. syrup. Because I think I remember when I was young, well, even now I'm frugal on some things. Sometimes these medicines cost so much money, you think, can I afford it today? So I just think it's sometimes be wise to get the, the off-brand and then maybe not to buy the cough medicine and try some other remedies. Um, okay, we're going to go to, I think I covered most of my meds. Um, we did talk about, Patty reminded us the other day at our study that any drug that says that it expires today, it's good for another year. So when you look at the expiration date, that does, it's even foods the same way. It says best by this date. It doesn't mean that it's poisonous to you to throw it out. So that's a good thing to remember. And then um, just the first aid kit idea. I made a list, you guys, of random things that I would put in a first aid kit. And then I kind of looked online and saw ideas of things. Um, a first aid kit could go in just one of these little shoebox containers. I think it just depends upon how much of something you buy. And if you go to buy all of this right now and make one, it could be pricey. I would recommend your um, going in with two or three people to make a first aid thing because I bought um, just four by fours here, like a whole, I don't know how, I think there was 200 of them in it, and it was like four four dollars or so, but you don't really need that many if you're making just a first aid kit. So important for wounds are gauze four by fours, and instead of buying more little two by twos, just fold this in four, and <laughs> do the same thing, less money. One thing I highly recommend, though, is Telfa pads. See how this is very um, see-through. Yes, <laughs> and it's um, what do you call it? Yeah, you know how it's got a weave to it. So let's say you have a pretty nasty cut or a nasty rug burn or whatever it is. You put this on it, and it's still bleeding a little. It will adhere to it and make a nice bloody scab that doesn't takes forever to get off. Telfa pads that are. They don't have to be the name Telfa, but Telfa is a non-adherent that we use in the ER all the time. And I don't know if you can see, it's smooth, it's kind of shiny. This is way smarter to put on any kind of a wound for a little kid or a grown-up grandpa than to be putting this on. Put this on it, and then if it's still bleeding or you want to pressure dress, put some of these on it too, because this, obviously this one's more pricey. But, and again, you can take, you buy one size, you can cut them up, you don't need me would put the other half a piece back in so they use it the next time. Um, different things, so let us let me just go through this paper rather than a space um, blanket. Or um, it's just, and this is really more important if you have a first aid kit out in your car. You know, like I remember one time I was driving down um, 38 and there was an accident there and this lady was laying all over all these rocks and all this muck. So I pulled out my little space blanket and laid it down for, it's just a barrier. Some of them can be heated, but this one is just, and these, these come in packs of three for about, I think, four or five dollars. Um, next, I got to bring a breathing, um, again, I probably didn't br bring it sub 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 subconsciously because, you know, just a mouth, if you're going to give mouth to mouth resuscitation to somebody, when you're in an emergency, you're not going to care about the germs that are on you. You're just going to do it. But a good idea to, in your first aid kit is to have a rebreather mask with you. But and you won't be able to grab it in time to your 
I mean, they're, they're, they're great to have if you have it with you, like in your back pocket or something. But um, if you run across somebody who's non-breathing and you need to, have to give, CP, give, um, uh, mouth to mouth. Give, give mouth to mouth or whatever, um, you're probably not going to have your mask. If you do, wonderful. But Unless you're one of Susie's RN nurse who carries hers on her, <laughs> her phone. Um, other things are cold compresses. You guys now at home, don't waste your money with this, using this. Use just ice in a Ziploc baggie. Um, also, I meant to bring with me is, I'm sure most of you have those old-fashioned beans that are in a sack and that you heat them up in the microwave and they're for heat and you put them in the freezer and they're for cold. Those are great for at home. So, But, again, you can buy heat packs and cold packs like this that are good to have something or stopping like let's say you're on your way up from Loma Linda and you need to still be icing your leg stop by any one of the fast food places and have a bag in the car I recommend putting um, some big bags in your kit one to put ice in two if you have a whole bunch of bloody drainage and stuff that you really don't want to leave on the side of the road or at your house so it's a good idea to have a few of those with you um, so going on real quick um, scissors and I brought my bandage scissors from the hospital, but obviously you don't need these fancy scissors. But scissors are a, a must to have in there. Then we talked a little bit about magnifying glasses and, um, and um, tweezers. For many different things you can use. Sometimes picking out junk out of a wound you could be using the scissors. Um, oral thermometers for a while were a hard co commodity to find during COVID. But I've had this same one for years and it keeps working. I have too. But obviously we're not using mercury I don't even think you can buy mercury ones anymore. Um, and then I forgot to bring some needles. Have a few just not safe, not safety pins, not straight pins, but needles. They are cleaner to use for picking out splinters, and they're sharper, the ends of them are. Have a few of them in a little container so that you can get splinters out. Um, adhesive tape. Um, there's, you can get good tapes nowadays. If people are allergic to tape, there are paper tape. It doesn't stick as well. That's why this Coban stuff is wonderful. If you're in the ER and they use it, they'll let you take one of them home with you. These are great because they stick to themselves. They're great. But you can buy them online now. The ones that are brown are a lot cheaper than the colored ones. I noticed that. Um, then talking about just different size dressing. These, um, just regular gauze rolls, they work fine. But these that are, these have elasticity to them. What do you call them? There's a name for uh, these. Curlex. Curlex. Curlex, because we can, I should open one of these up and show you that they have a stretch to them that um, is much more effective than these that are just, um, they don't stay on as well is what I'm trying to say. This will have, um, see where it kind of, it sticks to itself. I mean, it doesn't, but it does. This is much wiser than just these ones that are gauze rolls. Um, going on real quick. I'm sure most of you have these at home. But roll up a couple of sets of them in sets of two so you've got gloves. And again, if it's your own kid's blood, you don't care. But if you are on the side of the road with someone else's blood, you'd probably rather you not get contaminated by it. Um, ace wraps, um, antiseptic wipes. I could not find antiseptic wipes anywhere. Have you guys ever used them? Yeah, I have not. I mean, you could get disinfectant, like, yeah, but I couldn't find antiseptic wipes. And I meant to bring with me just the old-fashioned, um, I call them kids' bottom wipes. Go ahead. I have two alcohol. Right. Say you no, you're not going to use that to clean. Now, let's say you want to clean your scissors off. Obviously, alcohol wipes are fine. But, yeah, I wouldn't. So that's why I didn't stick alcohol things in my, in my safety kit, in my first aid kit. Um, triple antibiotic ointment we talked about. You, need, you can. This is obviously much more economical. You can buy the little packets, you know, like this, which are great, but it's a lot of wasted money, I think, unless you're um, on a road trip and don't want the hassle of all of them. We went over medications a little bit. I think, um, I think I've hit most. Oh, ace wraps, you guys. Make sure that ace wraps are washable. Let's say you have an ace wrap and you wrap it, it got all bloody and yucky. You can hand wash them. You can put them on gentle in the washing machine and reuse them. So, um, um, little kids, um, for moms, when you, when you <laughs> get boogers out of kids' nose, when you come home for, with a newborn baby, don't toss these out. Save them. Or give them a couple away 
age and some of your girlfriends have done that there's a way. Giving kids medications with syringes sometimes can be way easier than trying to give them with these little um, sippy cup things or the little cup because they spit it out. If you get put the syringe over the corner of their mouth, side of their mouth, they'll swallow it down a lot easier. Um, and I think, yeah, then that, oh, they also talked about, I thought it was a smart idea for irrigating a wound to have, you know, the old fashioned turkey basters? That, that's a great idea to do. Other little things I kind of, oh, somewhere here, a couple of, oh, band aids, you guys, that's what I want to tell you about. The, this came from Costco. I want to say you get two of these boxes, and I don't remember the price now, but they've got zillions of sizes in here. But if you're trying to make your kit, you're going to want to just take a, a small variety of them out. But these are great to have in your house. You know, some of us don't have what I call a first aid box. We have a first aid cupboard where we just have all the stuff <laughs> in it. Also, uh, other, other things that are good for dressings are these larger ones that are ABBs. That, but those are things that you don't really have to have or need. But the last thing I wanted to show you, which was new to me, was um, this. It's called it's called um, a non-sterile triangular bandage. And I thought, now what is that? Well, it ends up that it's got in here. Let me hold that for a minute. I'll stand by it. It's got two safety pins in here, so don't throw out your safety. And this ends up being a triangle, it's a gauze, it's, it's made on the, so you could use this, if, if I left it all wrapped up, this could be a pressure dressing for a bleed, if something's bleeding a lot. And then you take another one of these and wrap it and tie it all up so you can get to the ER. But what I thought also was interesting, we see this a lot up at the slopes, they come in with these, tri and it's literally a triangle band-aid um, dressing, but it's made on the so it can become a splint. So you're going to put it over your shoulder here. You're going to take this here, and then she's going to come onto this side, and she would tie it there, and then you would take here. this, safety pin. You and then you'll safety pin here, and it can be used for a, a splint. So you can get back to the ER or whatever you need. So this, I would definitely say, is worth owning a few of them because it can be used for pressure dressings. It also showed... Um, I looked it up online, but this guy was using it to immobilize, like if you're out, like Bill and Di Diana have been out on horses, and if you have a broken leg out there, it can also be used to immobilize to tie something up with. So I think, I think that's all we have to say. Does anyone have any questions? to be able to bring medicines to our hospital and they would dispose of them for you. And, and I, I think the pharmacies still will. Yeah, and I um, think the regular pharmacies will take them too. Uh -huh. They did. Yeah. yeah. They won't anymore? Oh. Well, I know that's true with sharps too. My son who's a diabetic um, again, the hospital used to give people sharps containers, and I don't know if they charge for them now or not. But um, and we used to take them and recycle them, but I don't think they're doing that either. They just oh, you can. Oh, personal sharps. Oh, good to know. No, okay. but medicines, yeah. That's yeah. We'll have to ask that one. They should take them. Yeah. 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 Judy. No, we don't use boric acid. I have not used that at all. We just use saline water or water. We, we uh, will actually, if we, we have someone that had got something really caustic in their eye, we'll actually set up a whole IV um, with the tubing and everything and then just run that whole liter into their, into their... Yeah, eye yeah. irrigation. Yeah. Uh -huh. it's it's yeah. <laughs> it goes all over every place. <laughs> Some of the 
those things. I know so often in the ER, you'll come with an eye injury, but depending upon what it is, we'll either ship you to down the hill or tell patch it and tell you the next day to get to an ophthalmologist. Go ahead. Uh, So um, long as it's clean and you're getting, not using the same ones, I don't know how long they last, you know, as far as making sure they're clean and not putting bacteria into that. Second question is, we're now working with these scans. Mm -hmm. I know it's inevitable that it's not going to stay back. Um, taking Benadryl or something like that, what's the best form to get it into the system? Benadryl, I, mean, I think. Just the, yeah. you know. The lip, the I don't think liquid. Do you, do you think uh, liquid Benadryl is any faster? I don't yeah. think so because these are not enteric coated. Mm. Yeah. It it yeah it may work faster being a liquid. It's already ready so. to go. But um, yeah, yeah it I probably wouldn't hurt, hurt to have it well, anyway. That's a good question. Um, Patty asked if they put it under your tongue. Would it absorb quicker? <laughs> I tried putting something under my tongue one time, thinking, okay, is this going to absorb faster? It, it didn't there, make know, any difference. Certain, like Zofran and nitroglycerin, all those are designed to dissolve under your tongue. But, yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, then well, yeah, it, it, it will dissolve. and. But that's a good idea because that's yeah. – Well, if you know the kind of spider it is, that's that would, right there would be helpful because if it's you know a, a real poisonous one, you definitely want to go right away. And um, you, it, it kind of depends on, like if you sit there for like an hour or so, and it depends on what, uh, how much in duration you get and how much um, it's swelling, the redness, you get streaks running up and down your arm or wherever you had it, you know. Uh, th those are things you probably need to be seen for. It's kind of like. We have Crofab. <laughs> and you, if you get a snake bite, the, the faster the better, you know, yeah, that I you get. Any snake bite, you just come into the ER. You don't question whether it's a poisonous one or not. Yeah, no. Yeah. Well. <laughs> and we, you know how we used to talk about putting tourniquets on things? We're not doing that this day and age because tourniquets are put on incorrectly. still go straight to an emergency room. Yeah. Limited mobility. Yeah, it's just... Yeah, well, hmm. we, have, we have rattlesnake medications in our ER that keep up to date and are used, and they're thousands and thousands of dollars, but so at least they're prepared there. Anyways... I think EpiPens, if, but I don't think you can get an EpiPen without a prescription. But I think if you have any you question if you have an allergy to carry one at all times, and like I've said to a couple of kids who come, oh, yeah, I'm allergic, but my EpiPen's at home down the hill. And it's like, come on, yeah, it's not going to help you. Yeah, it's too far away. Well, there again <laughs> is your expiration <laughs> thing. <laughs> I would say they're probably good for another year or two, so. Yeah, good point. Once it 
And um, even if it's less, um, uh, less strong, <laughs> this is less strong, <laughs> yeah, weaker, it's a good if point. it loses it's some of its potency, I think anything would be helpful, you know, um, if you're having some kind of a pretty bad allergic reaction. You may think it expired, but go ahead and try it. Let them know when you get there that you did give yourself a dose. Um, Thank you, kids, for coming. Yeah. <laughs>